think this panel is going to be pretty much a highlight I'm looking forward to here, that's for sure. Um, let's, we'd be remiss if we didn't start with something and get our arms around what the press reporting has been in our state about the upcoming sequest or potential sequestration. I do want to say that I think there's a little bit of a difference between what we're hearing as the potentials, and I think we're hearing a lot of worst case things, and I think there's a lot of anxiety about this issue out there right now because of it, and I, I, it, panels like this, I think, it lend a little more reality to this, so I think we want to get that and some other things out of the way first, and then we'll, we'll go from there. So let's talk about this. Let me start uh, down at the end. Um, what is real? about sequestration coming up. What can we honestly really expect in best cases about what sequestration could either, either do or not do? And by the way, we can keep a fairly loose panel here. If anybody wants to jump in on these things, don't feel compelled that you have to be called on, but I'll please. Mm -hmm. So I'm with Los Alamos National Laboratory and our rainforest this past year has been awfully dry. Uh, we've lost 1,200 jobs in less than 12 months. Uh, we took a $250 million hit to our revenue stream. Uh, and so sequestration right now uh, for us is just a little bit more bad news, but the good news for us is that through the efforts that we've taken, we've positioned ourselves to be able to handle uh, even additional worst case. I will say this, northern New Mexico is largely dependent on Los Alamos National Laboratory uh, for any kind of a rainforest, uh, using that as a metaphor. Uh, and so we'll do all that we can to minimize that impact, but uh, Paul Homer is here from Sandia. Uh, he's got similar issues here at the laboratories. Right now, we're in a very competitive phase, both from an economy standpoint and from a national security standpoint. And so uh, I guess our best uh, judgment is uh, we'll deal with uh, whatever Congress decides to fund, um, and our both Sandia, Los Alamos, and actually Livermore all have ascribed to the same uh, basic mission motto, which is uh, we'll do what needs to be done to preserve the mission because we feel our mission is awfully important. But the reality is <coughs> the economy isn't real good right now across the board. Well, I, <coughs> I guess uh, uh, I'll, I'll take a turn at this. It's, it's interesting, the discussion about sequestration. Uh, I recently received uh, a a reminder notification from a very senior leader in the Air Force that the position of the Department of Defense is we are not planning for sequestration. Uh, we are, have, we, so, so we are not making any specific plans as to what it is we're going to do to, to address that. The, the understanding that the department has with respect to uh, the impact of sequestration is it was deliberately designed to, to, to be uh, nonsensical in that it's a it's 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 going to be very very painful, and it's it's designed to take a 10% cut across the board uh, in all program elements the way we do budgeting. Uh, that was the intent was to force Congress to uh, to come up with a a solution you know to come up with something that is viable. So uh, so so we're not doing any specific planning. Uh, it, when we if we get into a situation where we need to take a 10% uh, cut, which is approximately what the the actual reduction would be, um, uh, you know, we'll we'll obviously comply with that. It, unfortunately, we'd be uh, a quarter of the way into the year, so it actually would be a, a, a more significant uh, reduction in our funding. Um, I guess what I would like to say from uh, the Air Force Research Laboratory perspective, I'm at, at Space Vehicles Directorate. Uh, we have taken a 25% cut, which uh, corresponds to about 50 million dollars. My uh, portfolio specifically uh, this last year, aside sequestration aside, uh, so we've been looking at budget reductions. Um, the one thing I would say with respect to sequestration, and you probably, if you've been following it in the papers, is uh, uh, the personnel system would not allow us to to to, to respond quickly enough to reduce our our internal overhead uh, costs in in the, within the the time frame within a year's time frame, uh, we'd probably end up in a furlough situation, uh, uh, but but we wouldn't start actually reducing the number of heads. So what does that mean? What discretion do we have? Well, it's with contracts, and so we would have to look at any external contracts that we have 
with industry uh, and, and potentially reducing funding for some of those efforts. So, um, you know, it, it, uh, that's, that's kind of the thought process with respect to, to sequestration, but um, I'll turn it over to... I, I have one more for you, Paul. Sorry about that. We'll um, move on in a second. Just, I, I want to get a sense of um, <clears throat> where do you think the community's head is at, so to speak, about this idea right now? Are, are we in a... Do we have our arms around this at this point for you, or is, is, it, is it too volatile at this point even now to really start talking about this in some detail? Um, well, I guess it's hard for me to entirely address how the community views it. Sure. I, 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 I'd say generally um, we should probably take a deep breath about it and maybe mm -hmm. calm, calm a little bit. Uh, you know, the biggest thing for us is it's, it's just another factor of uncertainty in, in the way we view uh, the future of the lab. And, uh, uh, you know, we're coming off uh, uh, three years of pretty significant hiring at the laboratory to prepare us for what we believe is a fair amount of mission work that we have to do. Uh, we're, prepared, we're prepared to execute that work, and, but we're a little bit semi on hold right now with respect to that because of uh, the uncertainty of sequestration. In the big picture, um, you know, I expect we might see some aspect of sequestration if it lasts two or three months while we go from January 2nd to a new Congress gets, gets it together in March and April. It's not that big a deal. If sequestration becomes a permanent reset point, then it's a bigger deal that flows into the 14, 15, and 16 budget period. I don't expect that, not in our area, because there's some underlying drivers that are pretty significant and substantial. Um, so we're, you know, we're just in a, we've suppressed our hiring in a little bit of a hold point. Um, there's a little more details uh, that go into the continued resolution, but I won't bore you with all that, that we're watching very closely. But um, I, I don't tend to lose, uh, to be too worried about it uh, because I don't believe it's a long-term reset. If it is, then it's a bigger deal. Mm -hmm. uh, I'd sort of echo the same points. I, I don't think we know. Uh, my best guess is they'll kick the can down the road. Uh, but it's sort of, that's sort of a micro picture within a more important macro picture. Uh, federal budget is under tremendous stress, under tremendous pressure. Uh, even if we don't see sequestration, there's going to be pressure on our budgets for them to be decreased over the next few years, no matter what. And I think all of us anticipate we're going to see some of those cuts. When you're running a trillion dollar deficit, uh, every, every program in the government is going to be looked at as a contributor to trying to get that down to a more sustainable level. So I just think that's coming. However, it, that's actually very germane to this discussion, though. Uh, as I've told a lot of people, uh, historically, we could be pretty sloppy about the way we did S&T, and both from an economic sense and from a, a uh, military defense sense, we could be assured that we have technical superiority over adversaries. Well, you know, we've enjoyed that since 19, the 1940s. We had it in the Second World War. We've had it ever since. Well, we're, you know, both because of the economic pressures that decrease our budgets and just because of the nature of the way the world is moving, that's becoming a task that we're not going to be able to recapture. We have a highly more competitive world, both in terms of economics, in terms of our technology edge, and certainly in defense. So it, it, it sort of produces an interesting challenge for us in the laboratories and for New Mexico. Uh, because we're going to have less money, we have a more challenging world in which we have to compete, and therefore the old models as to how we did that, which in many cases was a model where we, were, we very were internally referencing our own cultures. We, have, we had an AFRL culture, and we have a national lab culture, and we have lots of little cultures, and we, there was plenty enough money so we could all sort of work self-referencing ourselves. Well, that isn't going to work anymore. Uh, we're not going to have enough money uh, to meet national defense needs if we don't break down the barriers. So I'm, I'm, I'm very encouraged by this sort of summit because talking about a different ecosystem, a different way of, of how we participate with each other is not something we sort of would be nice to do. Uh, it's something we absolutely have to do, both for our economic well-being and for our national defense needs. I, I do directed energy, uh, and we work on high-powered lasers. High-powered lasers are a very interesting, challenging technical area. Uh, when I approach my job, I have two bookends of what I want to accomplish. First of all, I'd like to be the first nation that really figures out how to use those for the national defense. 
because by the way, that would really help secure our national defense. But the second bookend to what I want to do is I don't want to be the second nation that figures out how to use directed energy lasers, high power lasers, <laughs> uh, because that, it's not just a laughing matter. There are many areas, I mean, it is sort of comical, but uh, there are a lot of areas where if we're second best, it puts us at a, in a national defense posture that we really don't want to be at. I mean, it does, you know, there are, I'm not saying there's anybody we're planning to go to war at, but it's, historians point out in 1904, Germany and England were allies, and in 1914, they went to war. You know, the world changes, and person, reason, you know, the purpose of national defense is to make sure we are postured for a changing world. So, again, we're going to see less money. Uh, I think all of our organizations just realize that whatever happens in the next election, whatever happens with sequestration, there's going to be less money. And we have to figure out more efficient ways, more collaborative ways in which we can work together to do that. And part of that involves not only how we work together to do national defense, but also how we work together to transition those technologies more efficiently out to the, the larger society so that we remain economically strong. Well, I like that you ended on that. We're going to touch on that in our next round of questions just a little bit. Let me swing back to um, Lanel and um, Richard for a quick second. Given what we just heard from all four of our panelists just now, it's a new world, obviously, there's been a, a reset. What is that, how does that impact the research missions you've been planning on? I mean, uh, people don't come up with this in a 30-day time period. It takes a lot of planning to talk about research. So the things you talked about two, three years ago, are you having to reconfigure a lot of those ideas now, pressing forward, or do, are you finding your core missions are still going to be uh, the core missions, as, as usual? Well, I thought the previous comments were spot on. Los Alamos has a very insular culture. Uh, we are Mecca. We act that way. Uh, we, we've always acted that way. And we're having to learn new uh, words in our lexicon, collaboration. <laughs> uh, <laughs> We actually have phonics classes, collaboration. Uh, you know, Sandia is not the evil empire. Uh, our lab director makes us repeat that every morning when we come in. Uh, we, private industry, wow, that's a concept. Uh, you know, intellectual property doesn't uh, just belong to us. It's part of the American taxpayer uh, public wealth. And so the previous comments were absolutely spot on. We're not changing. By the way, we're all about people and ideas. That is our product. And so when we drop 1,200 jobs, we're very strategic about it because what we need to retain is the core capability of a great uh, national asset. And so what we're changing is not the basic technologies or the R&Ds. Uh, we actually have an amazing capacity to produce R&D almost instantaneously. And in today's world, as these gentlemen from the military know, that's a necessity. That's why people still come to us. So what we're having to change is it's a competitive world. There are other people that are engaged now. And frankly, I loved uh, Victor's uh, talk this morning. We're learning things like how to collaborate and how to involve other people in our world. I think that's the key. I want that noted on the record for all time. <laughs> Our Lanel director using words like, you know, private marketplace and stuff like that. Good for you. That's really good. Colonel, same thing for you. It's, you know, your, your research initiatives, are you finding that you're able to hold going forward the research initiatives you want to get, get accomplished? Uh, the, the short answer is yes. Uh, the longer answer is the Air Force has some very specific enduring missions in space. And I'm going to focus on space as Dr. Hardy focused on, on his mission in terms of directed energy. The, the enduring missions that we have in space are pretty straightforward. Missile warning, GPS continues to pr provide uh, position navigation and timing, uh, MILSATCOM, the, the, the COM uh, uh, communications capabilities on orbit, uh, and space weather. Um, so, so those are, are the enduring missions that we have. And so the, the, the challenge that we have is balancing performance versus cost, if you will. Uh, at, at, I think the sh if there is a shift, um, it has been toward affordability. 
So, so there's always a desire to increase performance and things. Well, the systems that we have are, are very, very capable, as everybody who carries around their GPS in, in the form of a smartphone uh, can attest. We have very, very capable systems across the board. Uh, the question is, how can we maintain or, or find improvements, but at least maintain those capabilities uh, for the longer term and make those more affordable? And there are a number of ways to do that. By, at the component level, in decreasing cost uh, uh, for solar cells. I know we have uh, uh, MCOR here and keeping competition and, and uh, a robust industry uh, that, that can uh, keep those components, but also looking at new architectures. One of the things that General Polakowski is looking at is disaggregating those capabilities and using hosted payloads. So there's, there's a whole uh, 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 new approach and paradigm that we're looking at for, for doing that. But in terms of the missions and the, and the investment in technology, those are, are the key capabilities. But we also have in our mission statement for the Air Force Research Lab is discovery. And so we uh, set aside roughly 30% of our budget uh, to, to go do things, to, to look at the art of the possible. What are the things that, that, that we have yet to discover? And so uh, although those enduring missions and the, the desire to try and push the cost down is, is ever present, we also are all looking at, you know, what, what can technology provide? And, and one of the arms of the Air Force Research Lab is the Air Force Office of Scientific Research, which funds primarily industry, or excuse me, uh, academia. Um, and so we put a lot of dollars, approximately $350 million a year, uh, across uh, academia in the form of grants and, and uh, for innovative research. And so we're always looking to harvest those kinds of things and mature ideas that come out of that. Look, look, um, can I stop you right there, Colonel Cooley, and, and ask you a bit of a follow-up there? Where do the state's research universities fit into that, what you just mentioned? Are, are, are costs able to be saved with more collaboration with universities? Are there uh, people aspects of this that help drive down some of those costs as well? Well, let me, let me, let me talk about that. So the, the grants that come through the scientific research are, uh, have not changed. Nothing has changed. There's opportunities for professors uh, and departments to engage and write proposals. Uh, as there always have been. One thing that has changed, however, is uh, Dr. Hardy and I signed uh, a, an educational partnership agreement with the University of New Mexico in April of last year, uh, which opens up uh, other avenues for UNM faculty to engage more directly with our, our scientists and engineers. And so um, we are actually seeing some of the benefits from that. I don't know the exact numbers in terms of uh, the number of grants. Uh, but they, they, they enable uh, increased cooperation and collaboration, uh, getting folks on base, getting more specifically tied to uh, the research that, that we're interested in. So there are uh, in, increased opportunities with UNM. We've also signed educational partnerships with well, the, you know, the Rio Grande Corridor, New Mexico Tech and, and New Mexico State, uh, to try and build up the uh, the rainforest. I love the metaphor of the rainforest because it is a collaborative uh, environment, and and one of the key uh, elements is the is the academia and pulling in academia, uh, pulling in graduate students who can uh, potentially vie for positions uh, uh, here as they come open uh, at the laboratory, um, and so those are some of the things that we're doing to. Uh, to enhance um, the, the, the area here. Let me just mention one other thing as a, as a, as a follow-on, uh, because it's, the, it's a little bit the mindset of the laboratory and, and models that work. So in 2005, Congress passed the, the BRAC, which moved the Space Weather Center of Excellence and, and, the, and, and our old geophysics laboratory relocated them here at Kirtland. Now, this, these, are, these are folks who have been up in Boston since the 40s, and uh, it, was, it was a tough move. Nobody was, there, there were a lot of folks who thought in the end uh, that was gonna change. Well, it didn't change, and they moved here, uh, and they had to be in place by September of last year. We, we met all of those marks. But the interesting challenge is, there's just a couple of universities in the Boston area you may have heard of. <laughs> None of any renown or anything, but, 
but the, 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 the laboratory had a great relationship with those universities. And so one of the real challenges was pulling them out of there, and, and proximity counts. And so when we came down here, we were very deliberate in saying we need to build up a stronger relationship with the local universities. And so that's what we did. That's why we, we pursued the educational partnership. And, and, and we're on a path to do that, but that doesn't happen overnight. That, that we're, we're, we're on a path to, to develop the faculty, and I have to say, I have to thank uh, Chowkey and, and the team here for getting us directly engaged in some of the faculty hiring so that we can be very deliberate about building that relationship uh, that, that, that we can rely on. Appreciate that level of detail in that response. That was perfect. And, and Paul Romert, same, same issue. Uh, you know, connecting SNL with San Diego with research universities and really getting some more vigor into that relationship. What's your, what's your thoughts and plans and what can you do in these times versus what can't you do? Let's talk about what we can do, I guess. Well, let me go back to, uh, to, to answer that question. Let me just touch on something you asked before uh, as whether this environment has changed our research directions. And I would say really, no, we're, we're fairly used to a fair amount of noise in the budget environment. Uh, you know, we've dealt with that largely by continuing to press on how we operate as a business more effectively. We've done things in pension and medical care, et cetera, et cetera, to, to make us more cost effective. But I, I think our long-term research agenda areas lend themselves, and I'll give you a couple examples in a moment, to collaboration with the university systems. In fact, we view that collaboration as really essential, not only to develop a pipeline of talent, but to also augment and accelerate the research itself. So a few areas that we've been on track for for a number of years. Um, uh, we realized um, well, four or five years ago that quantum and quantum computing was an evolving area of uh, tremendous significance and breakthrough potential. Uh, it's an area that uh, we have a, an outstanding collaboration with the University of New Mexico, and uh, we look to see that grow. Uh, the, you know, the, the previous panel touched on the biological sciences. For us, we recognize that you know, we're fundamentally an engineering organization that is not going to become a massive biology expertise house. But by the same token, we think there's a very intriguing intersection of micro technologies, microfluidics, nanotechnologies, and biology. And uh, we've, we've pushed in that area in our uh, discretionary research. And we have, again, collaborations with UNM's Cancer Research Center and, and activities we're doing there. You know, we, we feel like, again, we have to do that to augment the work, to also develop a pipeline of students, student interns, et cetera. Related to the quantum, but not quite the same, um, cyber and cybersecurity. Uh, you know, we have um, uh, significant programs in those. Probably that is the single largest area we've grown in in the last three or four years. Um, we have. Uh, how, how big has that percentage growth been in your recollection? Uh, over the last uh, four years, probably that program at the laboratory has doubled. Um, that's no small amount. Um, does it, yeah, does that show you where the momentum it, is, or it wasn't huge to begin, but it is now. I mean, yeah. you know, it's a more than a hundred million dollar effort overall in cyber today, mm -hmm. in a, in a number of different components. Um, part of that, again, uh, there's a real talent acquisition and talent uh, stressor there. So we have something we call a Cyber Defenders uh, School that we do with a, where we bring in student interns, expose them to real problems. Um, unfortunately, we don't have any shortage of real problems in this area, and um, and we do that collaboratively again with university uh, with universities, UNM, also universities in the Silicon Valley area as well. So there's a lot of opportunity, um, even in an, even in this generic area of national security. There are many good science collaborative areas available to us, and we. We look to continue to grow and use those areas. Mm -hmm. are, there, are there things that in your mind, I'm going to ask this in the spirit of what Mayor Barry kind of threw out there this morning about talking bravely about things. Are there things you're not getting from the university structure in this state that you would like to see happen? Something that just would contribute more to get your goals met. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Is this a question for anybody, or well, go ahead? Um, I was, I I was going to give I'll Paul. I'll pile on here. Okay, I was going to give Paul. You know, these. Well, look, I mean, you know, I, I, mm -hmm. I, 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 I leave it to uh, Dr. Frank and others to speak about 
their view of, of the health of the overall university system in the state. But clearly, the stronger that university system is, the healthier it is, the more it's uh, positioned to attract uh, outstanding faculty with the right type of infrastructure, the easier it is for us to latch our work, which by its very nature has to be at the leading edge, is with theirs. I think that we, on our side, and I, Dr. Frank and I have talked about this, that there are, we can do a better job of, of jointly approaching the state with things that make sense for the state to do, whether that's support for joint appointments or, 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 or more focused joint infrastructural approaches. Um, I think there are some things that, I, so rather than pick on the state, I would just say, uh, we, we can help do a better job of that. You know, uh, from the lab system, you know, we spend a lot of time focused on uh, Washington. And maybe we need to spend a little more time focused on Santa Fe and New Mexico. So uh, I, I'll just leave it at that. That's a great answer. That's terrific. Carla, you had a thought on that? I have four things, actually, since you mentioned it. <laughs> So, so, so hopefully none of these will surprise Chowkey. We've talked about these in the past. But one of the things that, that we're trying to work with the physics department in particular is to, to build up the sort of the space physics capability. Each department tends to build up a, a you know, specialty and focus. And so we're trying to expand the, the, uh, uh, the, the talent pool, if you will, in the physics department. Um, you know, the, the previous uh, panel said it very, very well, but, but I had heard this in a, in a recent visit. You know, we talk a lot about STEM, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. And in a previous uh, uh, talk I had heard when the President's Science Advisor was out here, someone mentioned STEAM. You know, there's another E in there that's very important, that's entrepreneurship. And, and the entrepreneur plays an extremely important part in this. And so, so I guess the, the, the challenge, it's not clear to me how to do this, but to the extent that the university can, can aid in that, I think would be very, very helpful. Um, along, the, along the ideas of, of STEM diversity, one of the things that, that is consistent with the rainforest uh, idea is getting the, the diversity. And one of the challenges that we, uh, wrestle with in terms of hiring for the workforce is is trying to increase our diversity and we do a great job in in a lot of the the positions but in those the science engineering type positions it's we still struggle with that and so working partnering with us to try and address that you know UNM this is uh, we have a great uh, opportunity to to increase the or for for uh, Hispanic uh, uh, population in particular to, to get m uh, a more diverse workforce in our science and engineers. And so that's something that we'd very much like to do. And the last one that I'll, I'll poke at uh, uh, the engineering school is uh, University NanoSat program. One of the things that we run in space vehicles is a, is a building up a satellite program, hands-on students, graduate students, professors, building up a satellite and competing uh, uh, with other universities. It's, it's, a, it's a great opportunity. I think that the, the school is, is, is pursuing that. But I have a, uh, in my mind the, the model from uh, Michigan Tech. Uh, their, student, their undergraduates, graduate students are all directly engaged building up you know, hands-on skills as well as the technical expertise. Uh, and and uh, those those folks are sought out by uh, satellite builders and manufacturers, and so I think that I'd, I would really like to see UNM uh, uh, step up to the challenge and, and participate and engage in uh, in that particular program, and and see if we could build a satellite out of uh, the University of New Mexico. As the kids would say, that'd be hot. Yes. <laughs> That sounds actually quite fascinating. I've been doing some reading on the burgeoning, it's always burgeoning the satellite industry. You ever notice that every seven or eight years it's burgeoning? And it's, this seems to be pretty sticky though. So this seems something real is going on. So that's interesting. Yeah. Let's swing back to David Hardy at back at the end down here, Directed Energy. Um, there's a theme starting to, starting to show itself in this conference and that is this linkage between uh, I'm going to use the word responsibility, the responsibilities of universities, the responsibilities of institutions like you guys are representing up here to this end of creating a culture of entrepreneurship. 
and getting something out there and spinning people out that can do things. It's a little difficult for the field that you dwell in, but do you in fact have a cut at this as well as creating entrepreneurs out of some of the things that you're working on as well? Sure, in fact, uh, you know, there's a, quite a laser and optics infrastructure here in New Mexico, much of which traces to uh, work we've done over the years historically mm -hmm. with them. I mean, when you talk about high-powered lasers or high-powered you know, electromagnetics, uh, there's lots of spin-off technology. Uh, if you're going to build a high-powered electromagnetic system, you have to have the modeling and simulation capability to model at the fundamental generation of the electromagnetic waves in the component. And that's actually an area in which we've had a, a, a rich partnership with UNM and one we'd actually like to strengthen. Uh, you know, it's interesting. Uh, we have specific applications of lasers and, and microwaves, but they build off of optics and they build off of electromagnetics. And there really is a transformation going on in the, in the way people do research. And again, I think it offers a great opportunity for us to work with the laboratories. When I was a young scientist, uh, you did enough modeling and simulation to sort of get you in the ballpark so you could design your experiment. But the proof in the pudding was really in the design and the experiment, actually building the hardware, going in the laboratory and doing all those measurements. Uh, you know, we're actually facing a world with the advance in high-powered computing where it's sort of turned around. Uh, what you do is you try and produce an extremely high quality model in the computer. We have the computational capability to do that. And you do the experiment sufficient to validate the model. It's really an inversion of how I used to do research when I, you know, when I was a young kid back when Grant was president or something. So, uh, <laughs> um, so I, again, that offers a great opportunity for collaboration between academia and ourselves because those sort of fundamental physics models those can be applied broadly in many areas, and uh, we can work on those jointly. It is really a, sort of a rich ground for collaboration across the, the community. And out of those, you can get all sorts of great economic transfers, because if you have a great model that allows you to, to understand these things, there are all sorts of ways you can apply that to produce products that might have military application, which are great, by the way. We need those, because we've got to defend the nation. Uh, but from an entrepreneurial sense, they tend to be low-volume products. You know, we don't produce thousands of jet fighters, at least not anymore, uh, or thousands of, of spacecraft. We in the military, even in the nuclear enterprise, tends to be a low-volume. So the limit for, there is a limit to how much you can actually get entrepreneurship from the direct military application. But, you know, it's the, the old spin-off idea. Uh, People tend to poo-poo it, but I, I actually think that with the way research moves in this modern world, uh, there are more opportunities to do that, and I think we under-exploit it. I mean, you have to be a little careful of saying the only way you can exploit what we get out of the laboratory is by looking at the widget level. Do we have a widget X that can be transferred? Oftentimes, yeah, but some of the tools we produce, and again, some of the world's most impressive computer models that allow you to, to analyze a system on the computer with extraordinarily high fidelity. I'll, I'll give you an example. We do high-powered magnetrons because they help us make microwaves. Well, uh, we can design on a supercomputer using codes we developed with the academic world over the last 20 years. You can actually do a mechanical design of the magnetron. You can do an optimization of it. Uh, you can finish that off the computer. You can go out and machine the thing, put it in a chamber, and you can get performance within the precision of the machining. So I can do all my design work for an advanced system on the computer and only have to go build the final product to sort of prove that, yep, I didn't screw up any of the coding. So uh, that's how I'd say that. I mean, I, I, I think we have a... Uh, let me just say one thing, too, about collaboration with the local universities. Uh, we're working hard on that, but it really goes back to Victor's point. Uh, it has to be an organic sort of ecosystem involvement at some point. Uh, I can tell my folks and the rest of the folks up this you know, steam panel can tell our folks we really need to work more with the university. But if, there, if we can't lay the organic framework for it such that it, it's sort of a natural evolution, I mean, again, building on some of the comments Victor had about how you do that, it's never going to happen. Uh, and it really does require 
all of us to figure out how with our own organizations we produce that cultural change such that at the individual scientist level or the individual scientist level with the entrepreneur, it gets done. Uh, otherwise, we can say it forever up here, and I really do believe we have to figure it out. Uh, but we got to get that done, and that's not easy to do. It again goes back to Victor's comment earlier. Uh, you have to figure out non-zero-sum games you're playing. And how do, how, not only that they are non-zero-sum games, but that your folks perceive them as non-zero-sum games. It could be a non-zero-sum game, you know, both parties are going to benefit, but if the parties don't see it, it doesn't matter. And that's a real challenge, I think, for we, particularly in the government apparatus, of how we, how we do that. And I think it's a real, a huge challenge for us working with the rest of the local community. And that's why I thought Victor's talk was so timely. The concept is right. Implementation, though, is is really hard because you're changing, as he pointed out, changing cultures. And cultures are resistant to change. People like to behave the way they behaved yesterday. We all do that, so. Yep. I think that's a great answer. You know, it's, um, <clears throat> it's been kind of a chatter out in the outside here, just exactly what you said. Everybody has to give up a little bit of something, right? In order for this theory to work and how you do it, it's the tricky part. Uh, Paul Romer, let me, I've got a question for you. One of the things that's always been interesting to me is we get hung up on a lot of the numbers uh, for research institutions like yours and Lanel and other places inside the fence, the numbers inside the fence. But it's always been kind of a mystery what, how the money sort of works outside the fence, if, if, if that's a proper term, what the community has access to perhaps with collaboration efforts, research efforts, things like that. Could you touch on that a little bit and, and some opportunities you see going forward in, in that regard? Sure. I mean, uh, I. Uh... Let me just start with a brief, hopefully brief comment on entrepreneurship because there was a nice comment made by the previous panel about the nature of the lab employees on entrepreneur and I agree with it. But I also would say there's more nascent ability there and some of that has to come more from creating an environment, reward system, support system internally to the laboratories that strengthens the recognition on the part of our people that that's important to them. And it flows right into this issue, right? So. You know, for, at Sandia, we've, you know, we have sort of the standard apparatus. We have the CRADA available to us. We have licensing opportunities available uh, outside. We've trying uh, to increase any of the science, the Sandia Science and Technology Park, which has had a number of successes as an area that um, we're continuing to work on. Um, uh, I see in the audience here today two of my staff who we've, we've brought to the laboratory more recently to try to uh, both invigorate the external face of the laboratory by, by recognizing that uh, it's a little hard for you to know what's behind the fence. It's, it's, we've got to reach out. We've got to make that more uh, available, not only available, but um, uh, easier for you to understand and see what uh, technologies we're developing. Even to, you know, we do $160 million a year of discretionary research in, in, in the laboratory and um, I don't think we've always uh, made that very visible in ways that people can understand and latch to. Um, so uh, we also do an entrepreneurial leave for our, our employees. I think that uh, it's, an, it's a program we want to re-examine and strengthen. So I think that there's a lot of, of mechanisms uh, that are there, small business uh, innovative research, um, so small business assistance program that we do in the state also has been a very successful one, and here I have to give the state credit because it's supported it for a long time at both laboratories. I think with great success, 2,000 plus jobs in the state are a result of that. So I think we have all the basic building blocks of that external interface, but um, I think all of them can use a fair degree of some continuous improvement and a, and a more strategic top-down focus on the fact that they have to be part of the laboratory's uh, uh, self-measurement of its success. Interesting. Let's swing down to Lanel. Uh, same question, entrepreneurial leave, things of that nature. What's your, what's your thoughts? I know we're just a little bit over yeah. time, Connie. So, Sorry so about that. So let me add a comment, mm -hmm. a couple of footnotes, and I won't repeat what's been said, but there was an interesting uh, discussion on spin on or spin off. And what we're discovering is that with collaboration with the private sector, like Procter & Gamble, we're learning about spin on. I mean, because some of their technologies in, in their R&D world actually helps us in things like manufacturing. And so it's that synergy that we've been talking about today that we need to be open to. 
relative to entrepreneur, it's not, as, as the previous panel noted and as Paul uh, reemphasized, it's not inherent to, to our culture, but it's not foreign to it either. I think uh, in the past uh, two or three years, with strategically, we have changed from an emphasis of trying to uh, pump up the local economy, if you will, by procurements, which by the way is significant. We, we do a large volume of procurements at Los Alamos. But we've realized that's not going to sustain the economy uh, into the future. It's, it's subject to the vagaries of the, of the federal economy, and that's not what we should be doing. And so in the last couple of years, we've changed the emphasis to worry about investing actually uh, profit back into venture acceleration and technology transfer. So I think I'll just reemphasize Paul's point. It's not like we can't do it. It's just that like anything else at a national laboratory, you have to develop the strategy first, and the leadership has to support that. Mm -hmm. Fair enough, as they say. Um, we are right on the number, on time. And I think, I'm, I have to say it again, same as the panel this morning, I'm hearing a new kind of language and a tone from folks like yourselves who work you know, really hard in this community to build a huge infrastructure that's a big mystery for a lot of folks in this, in this area. And I, I just want to personally say thank you to all of you because I think you're feeling it, as the kids say, <laughs> and that something has to change, something has to move forward, and I think there's a, a, a good sense of it in the room, and we appreciate your efforts on that as well. Absolutely.